is um, that this would lift the confidentiality order of uh, the council, any council discussions in relation to this particular property. Is that is that correct? And are there any issues that we need to consider? Yes, it's a difficulty talking about a confidentiality order when the content is in confidence. But I will ask through uh, through you, Claire. Uh, thank you, through the presiding member. Um, my understanding is that's a full trim container of all items, confidential items in relation to the strategic property matter. Um, I assume that the council member that moved the amendment is concerned in relation to a particular decision from earlier this year in relation to just the strategic property matter. Um, so I would just need to make sure that um, that request was considered in the full context of everything within that container. So that, so just for clarification, um, my understanding is that you're asking for the confidentiality, confidentiality order to be withdrawn on a report that came to council as opposed to the entire file or the, doc, the container that is within the administration? Yeah, that's correct. So could we actually put the date there then perhaps, sure. Councillor, rather than the container number? Yep, it was, um, uh, if that helps, presented to the committee on June 2nd and subsequently to Council on June 9th. Okay, if we can take the 2020 and the number away as well. So it's a, a decision of Council on June 9th. Thank you. And uh, in terms of the impact of which I have um, Mr McCready here. So Tom. Through you Lord Mayor, in response to the question, uh, first of all, without breaching confidentiality, is uh, the, the matter that the uh, Council Martin is discussing at present has no relevance to the matter that's actually presented here in regards to the state heritage listing. Um, however, we're very mindful of that, and I believe there's been some dialogue in regards to how or why has Council not presented this case prior to that. Council has informed uh, through SCAP and through all different agencies in regards to their concerns around this building. However, the matter which is related to in regards to the strategic property matter is something completely different in regards to what you're discussing tonight. We are well advanced in regards to our negotiations um, and very close to actually finalising those negotiations. And I am aware that the proponent associated with said building is very conscious of the matters relating to the Sands and McDougall building and depending on the outcomes will comply with that. Thank I you. Can't understand, sorry, can I, I can't understand how you can say they're completely different. And we can't explain why they're completely not different because it's confidential. It is completely the same. It is completely what we said then and what we're saying now. But it's a rhetorical, I don't want to hear any more. Three percent member, I actually do need to respond to. I can't talk to the report naturally, but uh, on the basis of the report that was presented to council on the two said dates and whatever, if you were to reflect on the matter that we're talking about, is it, it's relevant to the structure but not relevant to the heritage nature, which is located at 60 King William Street and this is the adjacent building. Members, anybody else like to speak to the motion? If not, I'll go back to the move to sum up. Well, no, I'd like to ask a question, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, it is um, Tom saying that there is no title connection to the first part of the item here and the second part. They are not related in any way. I just need to clear up that. Title. Through you, presiding member, the matter before you tonight is particularly or specifically talking to the Sands McDougall State Heritage Listing um, as it's locally uh, listed at the minute. The development is in its entirety and co covers a number of titles, but when you're talking about heritage listing in regards to this building, the matter that you've actually suggested is not does not have an impact in regards to that building um, and the reality is it's part of an overarching development which actually takes in King William and goes back into James Place. Well I think that, that answers my question and all of this turns on a, a selection of words. Um, 
this, uh, well, I, I beg to differ. Um, um, Mr. McCready has just explained to us how the interplay works. Um, and, uh, but I'm just, yeah, I, I'm speechless, speechless. Look, I, I, um, I urge members to support this. Um, it, it is important that uh, we protect um, this site, not just the frontage. Um, it, it is a building uh, and what remains of it of some importance. Um, and in order for our stakeholders to understand uh, our attitude to heritage and uh, heritage matters generally, I think they need to have um, that matter which came to council on uh, the 9th of June 2020 um, and understand also that council has been largely sitting on its hands since um, the, the project was announced. Uh, members with that we'll go to vote those in favour, those against, that is lost. Now that takes us back to the uh, original recommendation. Division. Council members, the division has been called. All those in favour of the motion, please stand and remain standing till all names have been called. Councillor Sims, Councillor Moran, Councillor Martin. Members, that takes us back to the original recommendation, and I will again look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Kouros, and a second to Councillor Kira. Councillor Kouros, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Kira. Members? Uh, if not, we will go back to Council Chorus to sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, could I actually have that recorded as unanimous? Thank you. Uh, members, that is the only item on the agenda for this evening. We are back in uh, Colonel Lightroom at 5.30 for our committee meeting. Um, I now call the meeting closed. That, uh, that the, uh, we are streaming, yes, so we are streaming the uh, live streaming the committee um, on the City of Adelaide website and a recording will be also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence and at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council and food and transferring outside of Australia. A little bit of country. A council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they, that they are of continual importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend the respects to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Apologies. We have uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Hyde and uh, Councillor Abraham today. Um, I now seek a mover and a seconder to move uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of October 2020 be taken as read and be confirmed as an accurate recording of the proceedings. I have a mover, Councillor Moran, I have a seconder, Councillor Kira. Um, should I like to speak? Oh, no, thank you, Chair. <laughs> okay. Um, does anyone wish to, else wish to speak to the motion? No? Um, Okay, um, so uh, would you like to vote to the motion? All those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried. Thank you. So today we have two items um, on the agenda. We have a, uh, a workshop, 4.1, workshop on social and affordable housing. So I'll hand to Ian Hill, Director of Road. Thank you, and through the Chair, um, 
Tonight we're going to talk to you through um, some social affordable housing um, work that's been done by um, you know, Michelle, but also Nicole and Lauren, um, Lauren from our community portfolio and Lauren from our economic um, policy area. I think it's worth noting that over the last few decades, the council has played um, varying roles in terms of social and affordable housing. Um, and we're at a point now where there are some changes, particularly at state government, that we really wanted to share with you tonight. And um, then canvas your views and thoughts about roles and responsibilities before we bring um, some more formalised paperwork back to council. So Michelle, I might just get you to kick it off, if that's okay. Thank you, Ian. Um, so through uh, the chair, uh, so I'll be presenting tonight, but I have to quick you know, credit where it's due. So to uh, Nicole and to Lauren, who if you ask any tough questions, I will be very quickly handing over to them. So um, you'll see um, there was quite a lot um, in terms of the long um, paper that you received. And just to rest assured, we won't be going through all of those pages, but it's a lot of information just to um, give you some background in this particularly complex um, policy area. So the reason we're here today is um, Council's um, decision at the end of last year that um, you've asked us to prepare a policy on social and affordable housing for the City of um, Adelaide. Um, and um, since that time, uh, after the delivery of the State Government Strategy, since that time the State Government has delivered its strategy uh, at the end of last year and then it is also um, delivered some additional policy uh, work as well in relation to homelessness. So I just wanted to really just think about what the levers are in terms of policy intervention uh, for social and affordable housing um, and homelessness. So we've got this diagram in your notes where it really looks at what the role of Commonwealth, state and local government is. And if we quickly really just go down to local government, um, there really are quite limited policy levers and really expectations on local government in terms of what our role is. So you look at this, which is from um, Ahuri, which are a um, very well-known um, housing and urban research um, body. Uh, really the levers that we've got are particularly around rates, um, zoning, which in, in our state has also got a very strong state government focus as well. Um, and then in terms of our infrastructure. So just to sort of set the scene, those really much bigger policy levers really around tax incentives, funding of public housing, um, et cetera, um, are really at that Commonwealth and that state government level. But as um, Ian has mentioned, um, the City of Adelaide has historically played a much greater level of intervention than perhaps has been um, uh, really recognised in terms of what our policy uh, leaders could be um, and beyond what, say, the state government would expect us to take. So um, I've really just focused on what um, state government and, and city are in terms of this slide. Your, your documents have Commonwealth's role, but our housing future was released by the state government. And when you look into that, there are really two actions that are levied at the local government, and they are establishing leadership and governance mechanisms and developing local or regional housing plans. Um, so what's really important and you'll see in your papers is that the state government strategy actually brought in homelessness into social affordable housing. So, and that's one of the questions that we're wanting to ask of you tonight. So should our um, a policy approach actually also incorporate homelessness to be consistent with the state government? Um, the, the key policy levers again for local government are rates, the infrastructure and voluntary inclusionary zoning. Um, in the past we have and, and currently provide rate rebates um, for our community housing providers and homelessness service providers. Um, we've previously provided rate rebates to owner occupiers, which I understand as a motion on notice last week and we had some discussion about that as well. Um, and to tonight we're really seeking your feedback in terms of what is your preferred role for um, City of Adelaide in terms of homelessness, social and affordable housing um, sectors? So they're the questions that we have for you, the scope, 
uh, and then what is our role? So is it in terms of health and you know, homelessness continue to be um, you know, a coordinator, um, funding some services and supporting um, in terms of social housing, is it continuing to provide rate rebates, um, support and funding for things like the Adelaide um, Zero Project, um, and also about advocating to um, you know, state and, and the federal government for ex extending um, you know, their support. And then in affordable housing, again, what, you, what is our role? So if you sort of that's set that to frame your thinking. Oops. So I guess if you take a step back, um, you've got in front of you um, an A3 sheet that really talks about the whole housing spectrum. But if you take a step back from that and think about the city of Adelaide and what is the biggest issue, so rental stress for the city of Adelaide is really the, the biggest issue. So about 35% of our low income households are in rental stress. Um, so that's about um, 18,000 odd um, households. Um, and this one, sorry, Oh, sorry, 1,800 um, households, and this excludes, importantly, excludes students in purpose-built student accommodation. Um, and um, rental stress has actually increased between uh, 2011 and 2016 from about 30% to 35%. So that's, that's an important um, you know, place to really focus um, what our efforts are. Um, and what we see in the city of Adelaide and more broadly in Metropolitan Adelaide is that really community housing providers are best placed to deliver this subsidised rental housing um, in the absence of um, NRAS. So NRAS is the National Rental Affordable uh, Affordability Scheme and it's basically funded 80% from the federal government and 20% from the state government. Um, in terms of um, our role in that, we currently have a number of existing affordable rental properties and you probably know many of these. So we've got 20 NRAS apartments in Ergo, we've got some in Whitmore Square, Sydney Place um, and many other um, sort of smaller, smaller, de smaller developments as well. Um, and you would have seen um, that these, these properties are really part of um, our strategic property. Um, review, so you would have seen those previously. What um, we think is a really important role for the City of Adelaide to take is with the economic impacts of COVID that we've seen, particularly affecting city centres and also the ending of NRAS over the next couple of years, which is really, we think, the role of state and federal government to be providing. I think there's a really important role for City of Adelaide to actually advocate to those other tiers of government for the continuation of the NRAS. Um, one of the other important areas that um, we just wanted to draw your attention to um, is mandatory inclusionary zoning. So um, at the moment, um, we have a voluntary um, uh, inclusionary zoning in our planning scheme, and, and um, but there's nothing mandated. It is certainly an area that the CLM is looking at nationwide in terms of the importance of having mandatory um, inclusionary zoning for affordable housing um, so that this is being provided at no cost through that planning system. Um, so at the moment we have um, you know, a carrot but no stick so, um, or no regulation no regulatory um, uh, requirement for developers to, prov to provide this type of housing. So again, we see it's a very important role for council to play in that advocacy space, um, along with our other capital cities. Um, a third key message really is in relation to um, rate rebates. So um, we, um, obviously had a decision uh, I think last week on the 13th of October um, and council um, asked us to consider a, a five year rate free period um, to encourage more key workers um, in the city and to bring a framework about that back to council for consideration. So what I'd say is I think it's really important and I would recommend that that framework actually form part of this policy. They, they really need to be integrated. Um, so 
If you look at the, the document that you've got in, for, in front of you, really I suppose you can take that away and, and think about it more. But there's a couple of key messages um, coming out of that. So when you look at that, you're talking really around social housing, affordable housing, and then private housing. So if you think about the social housing, that's really important to understand that is non-market, it's means tested, and it's very heavily subsidised. So the rental cost um, for people who are in social housing is only, it's basically limited to 30% of their income. So it's very, very different from um, you know, the private housing market. When you then move into affordable housing, you can be either talking about affordable rental housing, which is subsidised rental, or affordable fixed price purchasing. Um, rental costs are quite different from social housing. It's charged at 75% of the market rate. Uh, and then affordable fixed price, there is actually a, a limit in terms of the price that is set. Um, and this is um, under the state government. And then, of course, it, once you move into the private sector, then you know it's market rates. It's no you know, anyone can participate. Um, the, the document that you've got with you really talks about the, the primary responsibilities across each of those sectors, um, and who are the primary customers um, in terms of say social housing. It's, housing. it's really about um, very low income earners. It's often people with really complex needs as well. When you move into say affordable housing, it's low income earners and often these key workers. Um, so um, people, you know, could be healthcare um, workers, retail hospitality, creative industry, etc. Um, and then we've also talked about what council's role has previously been um, in some of those sectors as well. Um, and as Ian has mentioned, many of those have been beyond what is normally expected of a local government. Um, so, in terms of the whole housing spectrum. It's really important um, just to understand that, um, you know, in the city of Adelaide, mortgage stress isn't such uh, a challenge for us. So we've actually got much lower levels than metropolitan and, and national figures. Um, but rental stress, we are, um, as I said previously, that is an area um, of, of more issue for us. Um, and the important things to note is where you've got rental stress, you are um, often those people in those households are less resilient and have less choice if their financial situation changes. And that's where you can have that sort of cascading um, impact and effect through that housing spectrum. So I'm going to get into those really key areas of homelessness, social housing and affordable housing now. So um, you can see in terms of homelessness, uh, at, these are our August figures and they vary month by month. We get monthly figures. So in August, we had 218 people who were actively homeless and 117 rough, speak, um, rough, rough speakers, rough sleepers. So that has changed just, just slightly in the last month. We now have uh, 204 being actively homeless um, and 121 rough sleepers. So you can see that that's dynamic and it changes in our city. Um, council currently really provides um, support to um, homelessness um, via um, you know, things like the Adelaide Zero Project, our community development grants and rate rebates for um, community housing um, uh, providers. And um, in addition to that, we actually provide services, support services through um, our Homelessness and Vulnerable People project, but then also um, our public realm um, staff out on the ground managing those public spaces as well. So we have um, you know, roles beyond just funding and that those support staff on the ground. Um, we're moving into social housing. So this is both public housing and um, community housing. Um, it's important to note that the amount of social housing generally in South Australia has contracted over the past 25 years. Um, and um, there's been, I think, a net reduction of about 5,500 dwellings across South Australia. Um, this trend has occurred in, in our council as well. So we had just down under 9% you know, and that's moved to now just over 7.5%. Um, between 2011 and 2016 with that amount of social housing decreasing. Um, what's really important to understand, however, is that 
the number of people who are actually in need of social housing exceeds the amount of social housing that is provided. And we've got really long wait lists, not just in Sydney, but across the state as well. So again, um, you know, the, the primary responsibility for social housing is of course with the Commonwealth and the state government. Um, and our current role is you know, to advocate to ensure that that um, level of service is um, at least kept the, the same, but perhaps increased as well. Um, and the, both the Commonwealth and the state government are really um, seeking to build the capacity of, of community housing um, providers. Um, and in, in our city, uh, those are housing choices and unity housing. They're the two largest providers in the, the, in the city. And they're obviously always interested in partnering with the city of Adelaide um, and state government to, to expand their portfolio. The really important thing where I guess the advocacy can really land with the state government is there is still a funding gap for those community housing providers between being able to deliver that service and, and, and the cost of providing it as well. In terms of where we play in this space, um, we've just got some examples um, up here. You probably know many of them. So we've got you know, of course. Um, this is a really interesting blend um, of both uh, youth crisis housing and, and other housing as well. There is the NRAS supported housing in their 146 apartments. Um, and it's managed by Anglicare under a 20 year lease from um, SA Housing Authority. Um, and then I'll just really quickly flip through these. These are just some other examples, very different built form. Um, obviously, these are one of the sort of the historic role that we've played in the, played in the past. So Hocking Court, George Court, um, Low Street as well. Um, and then there's some uh, more modern and again, different types of built environment um, where we've got unity housing. Um, one of the roles that we play or have played in the past is as a partner of facilita facilitating land sales, um, but we currently provide those rate rebates um, to community housing providers. So we pay, uh, provide 100% rate rebate um, to community housing providers, and, and that's at a cost of about 600,000 per annum in foregone revenue that we would normally receive. Um, and then there's just another couple of examples in terms of common ground um, at Miller Street and Franklin Street as well. Um, so if we move into affordable housing, um, I think what's important to note is that for people who are on an income of say 65,000, um, this is a median income for both City of Adelaide and Greater, um, Greater Adelaide, um, really all dwellings are moderately to severely unaffordable to rent in, in, in the post square 5,000. So not, not North Pele, but I'm um, focusing on the city here. Um, and it's important to understand that not all low income renters will have the means to transition to home ownership. So rental accommodation um, really is a focus for some groups of our um, population and we're not expecting them to transition to home ownership in the city as well. Um, the state government's focus has really been on affordable purchase, um, not on subsidised rental, and that's why that role in terms of advocating for the continuation of NRAS or other similar, similar policy levers is really important for the city. So as I've said before, we've, we've been um, uh, had a greater role in um, social housing, but again, when you look at Sydney Place and Ergo, we've had a, a greater role in terms of a provider um, or an owner. Um, so again, in terms that was around um, rental. So in terms of fixed price purchase, um, that affordable price point <coughs> is set by the state government. Um, so while the affordable price point in most of um, well the rest of South Australia is um, 365,000, the affordable price point set by the state government for City of Adelaide um, is just under 420. So you see there just over 400 to 420. I think this sort of reflects um, the fact that city residents are likely to have lower costs of living due to reduced demand on um, public and private transportation to access both employment and, and key services and facilities. Um, but, um, you know, though, you know, without having um, a more a stronger policy in terms of inclusionary zoning, you're really leaving it up to, to the goodwill 
of developers to provide this type of um, this type of product. Um, and um, the planning reform that we've been seeing um, hasn't really proposed any um, introduction of mandatory inclusionary zoning. So um, again, you know, there are opportunities in terms of um, being a development partner, um, a facilitator, but also a strong advocate for to the state government as well. Uh, some of the examples in terms of where we have played a role in this historically and currently in um, through builder or owner or provider, um, a Sydney place, um, Whitmore Square Eco Housing, where there are um, we own 20 subsidised rental apartments by NRES, but there are NRES, but there are also some sites that are some apartments that are managed by Cornerstone Housing, uh, which is a community housing provider, um, and then in that same um, uh, development, you've got six that were sold to the private market. Um, you've got Ergo there again, again a mixture through that, that site as well. Um, and then of course we've got you know future future opportunities in terms of um, you know voluntary affordable housing as well. So really that's the end. Really wanting to hear your feedback about what you think we ought to be doing and including. Um, from here, we will be looking at, once we get your feedback, looking at drafting um, a social and affordable housing policy position, possibly including, affordable, um, including homelessness, if you want us to include that as well, and then draft that, we'll bring it back to um, obviously committee and council for endorsement, and also um, to go out for targeted um, stakeholder engagement. we do that and we'll bring it back to you. So. I'm just going to go back to that slide, um, which is really where we're wanting to hear from you in relation to what um, you would like us to see as our role. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. Any questions or any concerns? Thanks, Chair. Um, and firstly, thanks very much um, to everybody from administration that's worked on this. I can see it's a lot of work and really comprehensive um, report so thank you um, very much for that. In terms of to um, answer the, the questions, uh, the, the point about um, including homelessness in our policy, yes absolutely, I, I think um, we should it would bring us in line with um, what the state government um, are doing but I think also recognise um, the importance of that issue to residents and ratepayers. It is an issue that is raised with me um, consistently um, by residents in the city, but also people who work in the city or travel into the city, that they're very concerned about um, the increase of people who are homeless on city streets and their welfare. I can tell you during the pandemic, it was an issue that was raised with me consistently in particular. Um, so I think it makes sense for us to include that in our policy as something that we need to be looking at. Um, Absolutely, I agree with the points that have been made around um, inclusionary zoning. Um, I think it's a great shame that that's not mandated um, at the moment. Um, and I think really the state government needs to step up and get developers to be um, investing in society by you know, providing um, a, an affordable housing dividend because at the moment, you know, through an optional process that doesn't seem to be working. So I think absolutely we need to look at that. Um, I think in terms of council's role, I'm in the camp that thinks we need to keep doing everything we're doing, but also look at more in terms of playing an, an enhanced role, trying to increase um, supply of social housing, housing and affordable housing. I'd really like to have us look at things like air rights and what we can do to try and encourage um, an increase in, in housing um, in that way um, and also to look at um, beefing up some of our advocacy work. Um, I totally agree with the points were made about um, affordable rental accommodation um, in the city. I think that's key. I think there's also another um, point about the rights of renters in the uh, rental market and that can also lead on to homelessness too if people don't have long-term and secure accommodation. South Australia is one of the few places where um, the pendulum still sits very heavily in favour of the landlords um, and I think there is work that needs to be done in terms of strengthening the rights of 
um, tenants in the rental market. So um, I'd be keen for us to sort of move into that space as well, given 60% of um, our residents are, are renters. Um, so yes, my, my view would be, let's keep doing everything we're doing, but let's try and ramp it up and look at if there are opportunities, certainly as part of future council developments to increase affordable housing and social housing, looking at things like air rights. And I think getting those things in policy is key. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Um, Yes, thank you for that report. Um, I've been really keen to understand a little bit more um, around um, investment return and outcomes for the ones that we have already done. So such as the Whitmore Square, uh, a lot of those um, developments that we did in partnerships happened quite a while ago. Um, so I'm a bit foggy on it and I'm, I'm not sure that the rest of the members have that information so that we can sort of have a look at what that means um, for an investment profile. I mean, obviously, uh, we've been very keen to ensure that we at least uh, hit the minimum uh, in terms of affordable housing with our own uh, project going forward at, at the central market, um, our cave redevelopment. Um, and, um, you know, that is a, a space that we need to continue to advocate in. And I think, that, Ian, if I'm right, that we've actually looked at extending the periods that they're available as well uh, yeah just through the chair obviously it's a, it's a little bit easier when you're, when you're managing the, the development of your own asset um, the ability to work with housing providers and not have like a 30-day out to market and then pulled off market we can put other conditions in place that will more likely hit that target and I know Tom and the team are actively working on that um, in terms of inclusion of homelessness, I think if we're going to have a policy, it should be around homeless and housing policy, so that we are very clear as terms of what our role is uh, in, uh, for support or um, as an alliance partner around homelessness, as we are now, or if there's other roles that we need to play. So that policy will step that through um, and just formalise the, the partnership and the work that we are currently doing in that space, um, and also have a look if there's other things that we can do to assist. Um, in terms of uh, particularly around um, affordable housing, um, we, we talk about key workers and that's really about the diversity of who we want in the city. So a lot of the key workers work in the city anyway, our nurses, teachers, the police force, the fireys, and it would be fantastic if they could also make their home in the city. Um, and again, uh, looking to see if there's more work we can do in that area to really bring people that um, work in the city, uh, if they can see the advantage and the benefits of working in the city, which basically is about lifestyle and time, um, giving back time. So um, I'm not sure I've answered all the questions. I think policy scope, yes. Um, in terms of broadening our role, um, at the moment, uh, we could look at, again, it's, I guess it's a matter of how we do that through policy, but look at where there are opportunities for us to develop and get a return on investment. Um, I think that we should look at them. Um, and the same around social, if we can actually have a look where um, the sector where we can obviously advocate for more subsidised housing, um, but that's, that is a state government uh, responsibility. I don't want to step into the areas of state government. And that's probably good on the dot too for me. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Philip. Anyone else? Councillor Tom. Thanks, Jen. Um, I agree with the extend it into the homelessness area. I think that makes sense if that's the state government policy. The, the thing that I'd be interested to get a better understanding of is although there's the very clear distinction between um, Commonwealth responsibility, state responsibility and typical local government responsibility is in recognising that typically diversity leads to a better outcome across all the domains. If we do play a more extended role in any of these areas, social housing, affordable housing, be it rental or purchase, what are the flow on benefits to our city given as we bring more people in, of course, that has overall benefits to the City of Adelaide. So it has benefits both for health and wellbeing, recognising that diversity 
is is always a better outcome based on any of the research, but also what are the other benefits? So if we were to invest more in some of these areas, what are the other benefits that we might gain from doing that? I'd be keen to better understand that. Not expecting you to answer that on the spot. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you, Chair. Um, like um, my colleagues who've spoken beforehand, I would absolutely agree that it's sensible for us to align our policy setting with the state and therefore incorporate um, com uh, you know, thinking and policy initiatives around homelessness as well as housing affordability. Um, I'd also be interested in, in um, what the what the long term forecasting is projecting regarding home ownership as a segment of the overall <coughs> housing trend in Australia, uh, because I, I I only have a sense that for younger people as housing buying into the housing market is getting tougher and tougher, that uh, are more young people, young couples, uh, actually making a decision that they are, are going to commit to renting for life, as happens in many, many other countries, um, as distinct from home ownership. But I'm obviously of the generation where home ownership uh, was, the, was the goal to aspire to, and most, many, many of us have been very fortunate in that, in that regard. But uh, some, some forward scanning about what the state and federal government policy setters are, are contemplating in regard to that mix may also help us uh, decide where and how our advocacy can be uh, helpful. Um, I do recall back, um, so it would have been in the noughties that NRAS came in and uh, as is highlighted in, in um, these slides, the, um, the, there was a sunset period on the current NRAS program that was, it was brought to an end timeline-wise uh, um, many, many years ago. Um, how we might meaningfully advocate. It seemed at the time to me as a you know interested uh, policy person that, that it, it was an ingenious policy that brought private capital into uh, um, housing uh, stress mitigation and, and that felt at the time like a, a good thing mm -hmm. um, uh, as part of the mix. So I'm certainly interested in how we might, uh, along with the other capital city councils, um, uh, uh, play a part in advocating for a, a revisit of that by the, the Commonwealth and state governments. Councillor Mann, did you have your hand up before? Yeah, look, I agree with uh, uh, most of what has been said, um, with a couple of exceptions. Um, and what one is that I'm not so much concerned about return on investment. If indeed the council has made the decision that it wants to encourage social and affordable housing, then that is a, a commitment that it ought to see through and not be seeking to capitalise on what the original investment was. I certainly take up the point that um, it is important that a policy on housing includes some clear statements about uh, uh, rental um, uh, properties and what this council expects of government and the landlords. Um, uh, it, it is common in other places and it ought to be um, uh, common in the city of Adelaide. Um, uh, in respect of um, uh, our status, um, yes, I think we should continue uh, with uh, the approach uh, of uh, advocating and facilitating, but I actually have a view that uh, there is some benefit in the Melbourne model um, and it is uh, worth exploring. Uh, I'm not sure how, but uh, I think there is um, much to be said for Melbourne's approach. And yes, homelessness is important, uh, unquestionably, as other speakers have said. Um, however, um, I think we need to do a couple of things. The first is um, when we have a policy on homelessness that's uh, fully expanded upon within this 
um, ultimate document that um, uh, we don't uh, defer to government as we've done on occasions, saying, for example, this year, as the papers note, our funding is conditional on government matching funding. Uh, you either have a commitment or you don't. Have um, I think further that um, uh, we ought to um, be trying to um, take those elements of uh, community funding, which are related to supporting uh, homeless people uh, and housing, are removed from that area and, and form part of our commitment, not subject to, as it has been this year, cuts because of removing the three-year agreements in some cases. Um, it should be a, a, a firm commitment and part of that policy. Um, and um, uh, I think also um, we ought to be quite supportive uh, in uh, our statements of the organisations that are working to address homelessness. Uh, and that means places like the Hunt Street Centre, like Baptist Care and all of the others, um, we need to reinforce uh, that they are delivering an important service which is supported by the city. Um, and just finally, uh, I support mandatory inclusion zone as well. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think that was a really good point brought up by Councillor Mackey um, about ownership. So um, I really second that uh, request for uh, some sort of picture with respect to ownership. Um, and we, we would want to be informed as to the extent to which any uh, subsidies towards renting uh, may actually have deleterious outcomes in that they avail against, uh, they may prevail against uh, ownership in the final outcome. Um, I think we need to be also aware of issues. Uh, I think we, we, it'd be good to also be aware of um, issues like the extent to which subsidies uh, within the city, um, there's an opportunity cost uh, for any active subsidies within the city. So in other words, are people missing out uh, because dollars spent within the city may uh, be applied to projects that are adjacent to the city or outside the city. Um, apart from that, there's a fair bit of material here. I'm probably not the only one um, who really needs to go away, but I'll, I'll do that and simulate that and I'll get back to you with some queries and thoughts. And so I'll just going through, yes, I mean, homelessness is, is, is a major issue, so yes, uh, it should be included as well, because I mean, it, it, it's a, an issue for livability and all the rest of it as well. Um, I think uh, certainly I'm interested uh, in how we would be able to, as a council, influence uh, the affordability. Um, I mean, I was the advocate for social housing. I mean, that is a, a state and federal because that's we, we all have limits to what we can provide. But how, what does the business model look like that we can provide a level of affordable housing, etc.? But given also that. Um, if we if it's skewed poorly, then it'll discourage people from from uh, you know rent or having uh, rented properties within the city. So I've just got to make sure that I mean we don't by trying too hard to you know help those that uh, uh, need it that we actually make it worse because we're we're always discouraging others from actually investing. So how can we as a council provide as a, as a business model that it's actually possible? Um, and how we could potentially use that as an opportunity uh, as, as a, still as a form of income as well. It's not uh, as overall. So it is about, yes, what's affordable? Yes, do we do something there? What is it, other models that we can do as, as for people to rent within the city and that we can make it an opportunity for us to uh, have a sustainable council as well. And we have quite a few properties or potentially could get properties for that. Um, and, uh, you know, and certainly, work with all of the uh, community providers uh, anyway, and there's, there could be business models in there that uh, we could do something, but also all those that are providing services, because again, the city is a is a building point for, uh, you know, for all of those that uh, need assistance, and it's simply because you have a lot more people here. So um, ensuring that we're giving the best assistance we can, and we're obviously doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving them grants and things like that, so that they can provide services on our behalf, because obviously they're going to provide a lot of these things better than what we can. And the zones, um, again, uh, I would just ask the question, you know, um, what point uh, uh, 
does that discourage people from uh, committing any funds uh, to building things in the city? Uh, you know, because everything has a has as a case that, uh, unlike us, where we can sort of be a little bit more generous as in, in down the track. Businesses have to still make a, a you know model that works; otherwise, they won't build at all. Anyone else? Councillor Hyde, we're all good? Okay. Um, all right, I'd, I'd like to make my contribution. Um, homelessness is a, a, a very complex um, issue, and um, I, I agree in the sense that we have to remain uh, active in this part um, and uh, always continue um, with our answers that we have with other like with zero home projects and on, on all of that. But I think what's important in regards to homelessness is also the mental health aspect of it all. Um, I think we need to really address, um, because there's some people that do sleep rough, that will continuously sleep rough, and we need to um, really um, dwell into why that continuously happens. Um, and I noticed that um, even during the, the pandemic, you know, we were housing people, but they there were certain groups that just wanted to go back in the street. So we, we need to address that issue and work harder and solving that problem. Um, I encourage affordable housing. I think it's important for our young to want to, and for workers as well, that to work in the city, to, be, to stay in the city. Um, and I think it's important to allow our community, young community, to want to invest into properties in the city. And having an, a, a part in that and setting a policy in that is a great form and a f way forward. However, um, I, I'm a bit skeptical about having a, a mandate you know, making it difficult for developers to include that, or making it including that for developers in their projects. Um, what does that look like for them? Will it discourage them in developing in our city? Have to be really careful going down that road. And I'll, although I'm open to whatever you suggest, what what we should do there. Um, I think you know we need to you know work hand in hand with the state government and the federal government with what they do. Um, I think we need to advocate continuously for this. I think it's very important um, as a local government, but I don't think we should step into the state government's shoes. Um, and I think that we should uh, work with what the state government are doing and advocate and make sure that we voice our opinions in regards to what this city needs. Um, but I don't think we should be leaders in it. I think that should remain with the um, state and federal government. But obviously, yes, whatever more we can do, happy to look at some policies. Okay, next, next issue, uh, next item, sorry, 4.2, um, the Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Um, I have Ian Hill. Thank you, members, and thank you, Chair. Um, just back through to you, Dr. Tom McCready and Sean Fields, who manage the operations of the current aquatic facility here tonight. I um, did want to thank you for your feedback today and engagement with the administration. Um, it's been some fairly um, detailed conversations that have been going on around our survey, so we're going to capture those tonight and just uh, feed them back to you holistically. And then we are looking at some next steps about really looking for some clarity around location, scale and services, particularly around location. Um, and I think from that we will lead to some detailed work around feasibility before we go to any sort of next stages. But I'll leave you in Tom's capable hands now. Through you, presiding member, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. And as Ian indicated, thank you for the opportunity throughout the previous months to actually discuss uh, the Adelaide Aquatic Centre. As you're aware, the, the centre celebrated uh, last year its 50th anniversary. Um, and for those members who got the opportunity to go out and visit the site, you would, uh, uh, it was acknowledged that it's probably getting close to the end of its uh, shelf life. Even though it is uh, punching above its weight, uh, with 715, 717,000 patrons per annum, it certainly is coming to the end of its uh, shelf life. So just uh, what we're aiming to do is uh, 
provide the feedback from the uh, workshops and interactive sessions. Naturally, not all elected members um, interacted in regards to the survey, but this is the opportunity tonight to actually respond to that as well, and I appreciate that. Um, however, there was a general consensus uh, that the existing facility is at the end of its useful life. There was a lot of commentary on the visit and then on the one-on-one -on -one meetings that we had and also in various workshops. Um, there's general agreement among the council members that any new facility should be capable of 1 million plus visitations and what you'll see tonight is various models which ranges from a local facility up to what was presented through the needs analysis and optimal which is 1.3 million visitations. Um, council members had a strong preference for access to swimming facilities that operate all year round um, and that could be a combination of an indoor outdoor facility and it incorporates a range of water spaces and dry activities and naturally it needs to cater to a wide range of activities and provide formal and informal aquatic swimming opportunities. It was also mindful that elected members uh, understood the, the usage of the current centre where we have a mixture of what we would classify as general public and we have elite sports or sporting groups that use the facility. So how would we accommodate that or not accommodate that moving forward? Importantly, the centre needs to be designed to operate in a socially, economically, environmentally sustainable manner and uh, most new centres uh, would uh, achieve all of those components. And naturally, it needs to link back to either supporting their precinct or businesses, looking at that economic prosperity, and also public transport, which is less reliant on vehicular transport and cars coming to a centre. So the three questions tonight as we go through is uh, we're just seeking feedback from council members in regards to location. Um, we presented a series of options in regards to locations. Some of those were city centre location CBD, some owned by us, some owned by other uh, parties. We also looked to the park plans as well, where we believe there was a, a space, uh, a close proximity to public transport. So we'll be looking at uh, once when we presented that, members came back and said there's two potential locations of in interest, which we'll talk to tonight. I'm just asking your feedback on that. Scale is important. Uh, the reason being is to achieve 1 million or 1.3 million visitations. Uh, you, you certainly don't need a facility of the scale that the current Adelaide Aquatic Centre is, but uh, we're talking from 7,000 square metres and above to achieve 1, point mi or 1 million or 1.3 million. And we're seeking your views on that. And then naturally the services, the important bit is how, if you were to progress with us, how do you wish to service the surrounding uh, community, both the ratepayers of the City of Adelaide, Inner Metropolitan, Greater, uh, Greater Metropolitan, and also understanding the regions who actually make good use of this facility. So just to, to uh, take you on the journey, needs analysis, uh, Warren Green Consulting was engaged in August 2019. Community consultation on the draft needs analysis was in December uh, 2019, as you can see that ran from December through to May 2020, quite extensive. Uh, motions on notice, I think it was raised by yourself, Councillor Martin, in regards to a request to write to the state and federal government seeking funding, which we have done. Um, initial funding submissions, um, all linked to, if you note, note the gap and when that was mentioned, it was during the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. Uh, however, we did write to the state government and federal government, naturally uh, tacking on to the state government's push towards the COVID-19 stimulus package. Um, Council receives final needs analysis in June. Uh, individual meetings with elected members in July. Follow-up submissions made to the Premier seeking funding. Uh, there was a CEO verbal update in September and this is where we are today in regards to October workshop 2. So as indicated, uh, we have uh, sent out uh, funding submissions, draft funding submissions. Why draft? Well, the reason being is, and you'll see from the next steps, to actually firm this up, we would need agreement in regards to location services and scale, and then go out to a feasibility to be able to actually present a final to, to government so that they can actually look at that. In May 2020, submissions were made to the federal government via Infrastructure Australia and the Council of Capital City and Lord Mayors. Um, the, unfortunately for that, the Aquatic Centre was not included in the asset renewal. However, we've resubmitted through social infrastructure and we're waiting to see responses uh, from that. 
Um, we've also uh, reviewed the recently, the June 2020, the Office of Rec and Sport have released a new document called Game On, Getting South Australia Moving. And uh, under one of the sections in particular, it makes real reference to the services we provide at the current Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Whilst not naming the Aquatic Centre, it is very relevant to what we do. Um, so uh, the report also highlighted the need for collaboration, partnerships and coordination across the government and we've been starting discussions with the Office of Rec and Sport to see what's available and how we actually progress that as well. So the initial site assessment, uh, we went through various different sites and uh, you know, uh, what presented to elected members. Uh, at the, there were six potential sites within the parklands were evaluated. It was found that no other site was deemed to be better than the current site of the Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Um, and note that was also the feedback that we received in 2013 through Simply Great Leisure when they identified the site and looked at other locations. They looked at uh, possible, uh, the demographic that is actually attracted to that centre, most of them coming from the north, northeast. Um, they also looked at the available public transport and they also looked at uh, how the, the site itself and the way it interacts with the likes of date or school education, bus transportation, so on and so forth. Um, at the workshop on the 16th of June, we uh, provide several alternative uh, locations for consideration um, and that was suggested by the Lord Mayor and Council members when we went out and assessed that. Uh, subsequently, you've come back and identified two sites, and those two sites that will go into talks to part two, and it talks to the old bus station site on Franklin Road Street. Um, question two of the questionnaire provided four options. Three of the six responses indicated their preference was to construct a new facility on an alternative site uh, within part two, corner of Barton Terrace, West and O'Connell Street. Two elected members indicated their preference for a CBD location, a former Franklin Street. One indicated that the current site was their preference. Again, noting there were six responses, and um, naturally I'm interested to hear from other elected members as well. So looking at part two, uh, in regards to the current aquatic centre, as you can see it highlighted, uh, the current aquatic centre is in this location here. It, it was suggested uh, to look at bringing the aquatic centre closer to O'Connell Street based on uh, looking at an economic stimulus being close to that road corridor um, and certainly it could be accommodated within there if you actually look at the site, the overall site of uh, Park 2 being 158,000 square metres it could be comfortably accommodated within there. Just to note, to demolish that site and return back to uh, parklands, it's somewhere in the region of six to seven million dollars. Um, so whatever new option that you would look at, you have to take into account that the demolition and, and uh, make good. Unless, of course, it's actually on the existing site. Uh, but that would, that would involve the aquatic centre shutting down for a period. Um, the, there's access to high frequency public transport, although it is limited, um, so we have to have discussions with our DIPTI or whatever their, the current name is in regards to public transportation to see if we could actually uh, make that better. Uh, it would be perfect if the tram actually got across the bridge and came up into North Adelaide, that would certainly help as well. Um, relocating the facility would have some impact to users travelling to northwestern suburbs with increased walking distance to stops on the opposite side of Fitzroy. However, it is strategically better if a future tram extension did go across and certainly aligned itself with the current centre. Also to note, when we looked at the, uh, the connector bus and whatever, interestingly, one of the things that we could look, look at in the future is to say that the connector bus could actually stop at the centre, so actually assist in regards to picking up or dropping off people at the centre is not currently included on that route. Um, would allow existing facility to remain operational if we were to move it to that corner um, to provide uh, business continuity um, whilst the new facility has been uh, developed and would have minimal impact on existing users. Effectively, it would be a transition from one site to the other. Former Franklin Street bus station. An um, interesting thing about the site, if you can see it's actually divided in two with a roadway going down the middle, however that could always be closed over. Um, the, the site is 6,850 square metres. It would not achieve 1 million visitations because we need to north of uh, 7,000 square metres. If you were to look at this, you would have to go to a multi-storey type facility. 
in saying that, it would also put pressure in regards to parking, because uh, effectively you'd be using the whole boundary of that site to achieve an aquatic outcome. So the only other option would be to look at the car park to the side, which is currently a paid car park. Um, the site doesn't allow for free car parking. Um, there could be a significant impact on existing users in, in terms of travel distance and availability of free parking. Um, it may drive visitation secondary spend at nearby businesses, so it is important it could be seen as an economic stimulus in regards to the central market. There is no impact on the parkland, very conscious of that. Um, it's a significant area of vacant land within the CBD. It is uh, important to note that when we presented the strategic property action plan, this site was actually identified as a main catalyst site and based on the presentation you had prior to this one, it was identified as a mixed use site which would actually accommodate residential and affordable housing as well. We do not know of any aquatic facility that builds directly above to achieve those sorts of outcomes. They're normally in aquatic centre as a standalone facility. Um, Council at uh, the, the above uh, meeting in regards to strategic action plan actually resolved us to progress that and look at the options. We could consider this as part of the options, but again, to partner with someone, uh, I haven't uh, come across any development that's actually included a community facility beside what is common ground or housing options or choices, which is affordable housing. It's an interesting site, but I don't know if it could be achieved. Uh, temporary car park in the site opportunities are currently being considered for the site. Why are they being considered? If you remember the Central Market Arcade redevelopment, we talked about once we remove the parking within the, the current Central Market Arcade, we'd look across the road to support Central Market in regards to temporary parking until such times as the, the market is redeveloped. So just, just uh, on scale, the question of scale, uh, the, the first thing is the Adelaide Aquatic Centre is a very large and inefficient facility. It's, it's circa 12,000 square metres, uh, that's not including the car park. Um, you know, at, at the minute it's got a very, when you look at its business components, the gymnasium is quite small, that's actually quite a, a cash cow, an opportunity to drive revenue. Swim school is restricted, we don't have a lot of uh, shallow warm water to accommodate. Is this exact, are you just reading the PowerPoint presentation? I'm going through the key items for those members who probably weren't aware of this. If you want me to cut to the questions, well, they're happy we to. Have we all read the um, report? Do we really need it to be read out to us like this? Can't we go I'm in, I'm in the chart. There's only key points, I'm all right. It's only the stuff at the left, that's all right. No, no, but I'm, I'm good with this. We, we've all, right. all agreed that we don't just get read we out. We're going to finish by now. The lazy houses that have bought three or three. Oh, right. It's a waste of time. We've got read it. I know what it's saying. Right, Shannon. Make your hands What's the point of uh, reading it? You're just going to have it read to you. Tom, just keep to the key points and we'll keep going. That's what I was doing, presiding member. Thank you. Um, so, from my perspective, when we're looking at this, is when we look at the facility, and I think it's really important to note is a local facility which is at scale certainly less significant on the parklands would only generate 500,000 uh, visitations. However, when it comes to uh, revenue generation, it will actually cost council more money in the long run and will actually run out of negative variance. The optimal ones are from a million plus and 1.3 million visitations, which would actually see revenue significantly increase, but it comes with a cost. And you can see that indicative cost down at the bottom in regards to cost of build. Um, so effectively, the, what was presented at one stage was if you were to look at status quo, what's the indicative capital costing? Um, it ranges between 16 to 21 million, which was earmarked over the next 10 years or so in regards to capital investment to the existing centre. Um, example of regional facilities, which was presented before to the right, and which can achieve 1.10 million visitations or above is in the region of 45 to 55 million, noting that doesn't cater for the, the demolition. Um, but you can see certainly the net performance is significantly enhanced where you look at the current centre with the 700,000 deficit moving to a $1 million surplus, which was presented through Warren Green Consulting. That also talks to an indoor-outdoor pool as well. 
services, the current services uh, naturally have uh, adapted through time based on the current facility. However, uh, what uh, national uh, facility trends say more flexible and multi-use competition and training pools for clubs, squads, schools and lab swimmers. So it provides a level of flexibility, warm water programs, pools for older adults and rehabilitation. So that's, uh, that's moving towards the uh, allied services stroke uh, hydrotherapy treatments, um, purpose-built leisure and uh, learn to swim pools and actually interactive fun play areas for families who come along, spas, saunas, relaxation. Um, and the community feedback generally has been they are supportive of those sorts of activities. Um, and effectively what they would say is they would like to see that in. Um, just in regards to services continued, um, as it says, uh, key facility components, uh, initially in the needs analysis, it talked about a 25 metre pool, large, learn to swim, leisure water, large, warm water pool, large, spa, sauna, steam, gym, a lot of emphasis from the community in regards to gym facilities. Um, what we're saying is that we're not talking next generation, but we're talking about community gym facilities which are available to all and um, priced accordingly. Um, program rooms, program rooms are for classes, um, where at the minute the current facility does not have that. Looking at the creche, which supports uh, parents coming along where they can leave their children while they uh, take part in activities, cafe and service uh, areas. Um, there was a consensus that the focus should be primarily towards the delivery of community-focused aquatic recreational services as listed there. So just in response to the council feedback, car parking, two of the six councillors indicated support for increasing the size of the car parking. Um, several responses indicate a preference for local car parking underground, noting that car parking underground comes with significant cost. So you move from a, if you're moving from an upgrade, uh, if you're going up above, it's 20 to 30,000 per bay. When you start to go underground, you're talking anywhere between 60 to 70 thousand dollars per bay. Um, indoor and outdoor, four of the six responses indicate a preference for a new facility that combines both indoor and outdoor spaces. Major sporting events, uh, three of the six responses supporting designing the facility to accommodate major events. That comes back to the questions of the con games and things like that. And then naturally ongoing operations as listed. Thanks Tom, I'm conscious of time. Can we go straight to questions? We can. So the questions quite simply uh, for tonight is feedback from council members uh, have suggested two pot potential locations of interest. If there's any more elected members happy to, to take that on board. What are your views uh, of the suggested site uh, so we can progress with the detailed feasibility? Um, the scale is noting the current footprint. Naturally, there's a real push to decrease the footprint. I think we can do that to achieve 1 million or 1.3 million. And what are your views on the redevelopment options? And then naturally, the services which are critical the services to support the community. I mean, your hands per second now. Thank you, Tom. Okay, any, any members might speak? Yes, I'm, I'm a little surprised that the report so strongly based on six out of 12 councillors' responses. Um, but however, I'll plough on. I very, I'm very keen on and have suggested before the city location, change to the city. I suggested the riverbank or maybe Franklin Street. So I wouldn't rule that out. But if you're going to keep in part two, obviously. Um, the current site is, um, in my mind, the best site. You obviously will have to demolish some of it, but there's a lot of underground um, infrastructure there that could be kept uh, that's been upgraded all the time, it's got a new roof. So I, my suggestion is that we, um, we rebuild on the current site. We might have to close it for a while, but it's not the end of the world. Um, it would save the five to six million dollar demolition cost. It, I don't understand the close to public transport. There's public transport down Jeffcott Street. So it's very, and down the Ring Road and uh, it's very close to public transport. The change to the other site in Park 2 would be unpopular as it's very close, it comes very close to residents. And I'm sure the uh, 
Constitutional Affairs from the Barton Terrace would be very unkeen to have it there. That was only mooted as a site because the Crows wanted to be close to the Caledonian Hotel to make it their drinking hole. Uh, so I don't think we need to follow that blindly. Um, I think the, the footprint could be decreased on the current site and that's what I'll go with. But I'm not absolutely not averse to a city site. Councillor Kimmer. Uh, I agree with Councillor Moran. I think I'm in favour of the, either the current side. I'm not so averse to part two, but I think that the issue is we really have to have a full understanding of the opportunity cost with the city based site and the value um, present that we would lose out on by shifting to the city. Um, but I'm not averse to that happening, but we must be appraised of the opportunity cost completely. I've just got a question. What? Is there scope for modular design with this? Is it taken for granted? That is, of course, building uh, to a certain size, uh, but allowing and actually in that design, envisaging, incorporating the means by which expansion can take place in future years. Now, is that taken for granted or is that something that has to be um, a purposeful decision given it may present uh, restrictions in and of itself or costs? Through you, presiding member, if uh, uh, just take you to the drawing to the right hand side, that can actually be done modular. So, uh, effectively, what we've talked about is a 25 metre pool and leisure pools and gymnasium. Um, the outdoor pool facility, for, for example, can be added on at a later date, so it can be staged in regards to development, should we wish to do it like that. And any of these uh, facilities can be done in, in modular and you can add on, you can add floors if you wish to. For instance, you could increase the floor plate on the ground floor if you were to double up on your gymnasium and go double storey. Um, that would certainly free up space there. So there is the opportunity, but that has been drawn in such a way that you can add the outdoor component on, onto it. And presumably that, that includes, that is um, bound, uh, guided by what is essential or considered to be essential first and what is more discretionary down the track and what can then add to the essential site and that's that's all taken into account isn't it what's presented through your presiding member that's indeed correct but also based on tonight is what level of services does council wish to provide which would dictate how modular or what what scale and size yeah. okay councillor sims thanks chair and thanks um tom um I guess my view in terms of level of service council should provide and, and so on. Um, I think we need to do some sort of a people's panel or a people's jury or something along those lines um, to try and uh, tease out some of the feedback we've had from the needs analysis and to build kind of community consensus around what goes um, next. Um, I think that's really uh, important in terms of how we work out how we proceed with this because what we have to learn the lessons from what happened with the crows um, uh, fiasco um, and that's not a criticism of administration that's a criticism of the elected body i think we did not um, handle that appropriately as an elected body um, and it was clear there wasn't community consensus around that. So, but my point view of, would point, be point of order, Chair. Is this really the opportunity for a council to have a go at other councils? I'm not having a go. Tangentially, really, at best, tangentially related. Through you, well, it being a workshop, he's declaring the uh, what the consultation of that. Oh, now that. But can you just yeah, move yeah, more sure, to the point on sure, the workshop, Chair. please? Yeah, just, so. just to be clear, I actually wasn't having a go at anybody. I'm oh, making oh, a broad. No, no. I'm making a broad. Can we just point. keep to the point? about how we can um, approach this differently going forward. And I do think there is merit in some sort of model, people's panel, citizens jury or whatever, that could deal with some of these questions and try and build a community consensus that then could come to council and that we could consider and potentially get behind. Because otherwise, I think it's going to be difficult for us to reach a, an agreement as an elected body around how we, we manage this. So that's my my five cents worth. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Anyone else? Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I um, am just looking at that. Is the is the outdoor bit an extension on what you're proposing, or is that included in that forty-five to fifty-five? 
through you, presiding member, Lord, where the, when we done the feasibility, we actually got the QS uh, in regards to the inclusive of the outdoor, and that came to around about $49 million or $50 okay. million. Um, because one of the things that I was very keen to see is the retention of the 50 metre pool um, in terms of community feedback and a lot of swimmers uh, that have contacted me. There's very few 50 metre pools um, around these days and they, they do actually um, enjoy the lap swimming 50 metre pools. It also allows for um, the school sports, etc. So and I know that we use the boom a lot to divide the pool into two 25 metre sections, but um, so I'm keen to understand how often it is actually used as a 50 metre pool before we make that decision. Um, I am very happy to keep it in North Adelaide. Um, I, I would support it being on the existing site. I also support it another site in part two. And the reason being that it was very clear and we did have some protesters there say, please don't close the pool. And it was really about if we're going to demolish and build, it will be two years and therefore um, there will be no recreation facility or swimming facility there. And that, that's the one that I'm most mindful of, um, as well as the connection to um, O'Connell Street uh, with other investments happening there, we hope in that same time frame, so um, that this would become a, a, a regional facility that would really connect uh, to Prospect and also back into North Adelaide. Um, the, the exact location, I. I, you know, I don't think we've got to that, but um, I'd be keen to understand the pros and cons of existing site in terms of the, the, the construction, in terms of demolition and being able to construct on site versus being able to construct on a nearby site and then demolish and return to park plans. Um, it would have to be absolutely a proviso that the original site is returned. Uh, to Parkland so that we get a net gain uh, of Parklands once we complete the project. Um, the other thing is um, I do actually know, you know a, a couple of members looking at the city site which I think is great for us to look at. Um, I don't think the mark that site is the site, um, mainly around the size of the facility that we can build um, but also that means that we would lose all the maker spaces around there which is uh, and the opportunity to do some other joint venture partnerships in the near future. So, um, in terms of scale, I think I've said the scale uh, that 45 to 55 million sort of sits very comfortably with me. A million dollar, uh, a million uh, attendees um, plus, and uh, and the incorporation of the warm water pools and the uh, wellness areas, particularly the gymnasium, the ability to do active programming. Um, does that, because I can't quite work out, does that include any sort of deep water for um, polo, exercises, physio, anything like that? Because I can't work out what an LTS pool is. Through, through you, uh, presiding okay. member, uh, the, that is a, an interesting discussion. What water polo typically is a regarded as a state government type uh, sporting activity. So that's the discussions we're certainly having with the Department of uh, Rec and Sport. However, a, a 15 meter pool typically would be envisaged as probably being in the region about two meters deep. Um, so can it accommodate water polo? Yes. Can it accommodate competition water polo? Potentially no. If you go deeper, then you go into the realms of, again, energy costs, utilisation, and you're really building it. At the minute, we have about 50 people who uh, can they, train, can they train in that? Though? They can train if it's two metres deep, yes. so they can train, but they can Correct. still use the um, marine facility for competitions. Correct. Correct. Okay. I think that I think that's really what they're trying to achieve that they can do their training. Um, and the I can't remember what the last question was. Um, oh, services. I think we've talked about. That's good. Thanks. Anyone else? Councillor Ron. Yes. Um, I mean, uh, sort of the design and that uh, I agree with, with 
the others that it's, uh, it's around the sort of sizing i mean it is about what the community put themselves forward so i think you know that, that's less of a question for me i mean between the two sides i mean the, the main issue well why not the, the concern would be i mean we're looking at the the people that are, are using the facility now um again we, we say where are they coming from and all of those sort of questions whether it be the school and and how people access it because obviously the dynamics will change completely between one and the other and the sort of people that you would expect to be using would, would alter somewhat as well. So it is to better understand that. So whether it be a school um, uh, and identify the sort of users. But again, if we're going to talk about having to do a couple of stories uh, and, it, and, and where you have the gym and that uh, upstairs, um, is there a, 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 would there be a difference in the number of people, you know, which would presume uh, would use that as uh, the, the gym facilities and would that would something like that I mean again it's about the total uh, income and the total expense of, of whatever you're going to do wherever you're going to do it um, so how does that one work against the other I mean we do have obviously a, a car park next door how does that look I mean and obviously we have facility there for buses to stop but again it depends how many people are using the, the, the swimming school and who are they um, so that's important. And the public transport, again, where are we then expecting our, 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 our user to come from? I mean, obviously by using it at the secondary side, I mean, I don't think it uh, would be politically uh, that palatable by saying we have to close it because two years is a long time and uh, starting from scratch. What does that look like when you're starting up again? And because obviously there's a, there's a cost all the way through and one, so one may negate the other as you start to do the sums both ways. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the only other thing is, I suppose, with, with the inside city side, the only time that would get interesting if there was a potential for someone to use there and saying, OK, we do this because I mean, obviously we're doing something in the, in the central market uh, arcade that we're using for, for a commercial purpose for ourselves, which is fantastic. Um, you know, is that something that will work? If yes, uh, you know, what are the limiters and all the rest of it? So that we do come back. Yes, we do. Uh, uh, it is about a site that will attract a million to 1.3 million. It is, uh, uh, you know, it can be an indoor outdoor. I mean, if we're having to do a 50 meter pool, we're going to say that, well, in that case, why don't you get rid of the 25, put the 50 meter in and, you know, and do that. You know, it's because it's uh, that way you're not running too. Uh, and again, that, it's, it's worth asking the question because if we're heating the pool with, with solar or what have you, and you're getting two, two to three months use out of it, I think, um, then you can start to ask. And also, when are your peak times? Because you were made comments before about now that winter was a quiet time, or what is that? That dip and rise because that may also inform us where you put the pool. If it is outside, fantastic. That's because that's what people want it. Um, so there's still a few more questions that need to be asked. Thank you, Lobby. Had a question? Um, I was just probably stating the obvious, but you'll be bringing this into Parklands Authority for feedback. At some point, thanks. Councillor Mackey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to stay, say at the outset, I'm, my position in advocating that we explore the CBD location does not mean that that is the only solution that I'm open to. I'm open to a win-win that for public, substantial public investment, whether it's a cocktail of council, state and federal or, or um, two of the three or, or indeed if we're left to our own devices, that we, that we look to how we can leverage the maximum benefit for the future of the city. Our, our current uh, facility, as we all know, is ageing uh, and it's been around for 50 years, uh, thereabouts. Um, we're making a decision that can potentially catalyse uh, other outcomes as well as being a more, hopefully, more viable business in its own right. And so I'm very keen on a comparative business uh, case that actually looks at the opportunities and, and as uh, Councillor Kerr said, the opportunities, the opportunity costs, um, and that we also factor in the social and cultural dimensions uh, of it and its potential from one location to another to play a part in successful placemaking uh, for the city for the for future decades. Councillor Martin. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I, I also uh, am concerned that, that we are discussing uh, what is a, a proposal endorsed by three or four councillors. 
uh, I did not participate in this process because um, I believe that we should be talking about these things openly and making uh, transparent decisions rather than doing uh, polls uh, uh, privately. Um, however, um, let me say that I think uh, those three or four councillors have come to the right conclusion um, uh, miraculously and uh, I endorse everything that the Lord Mayor has said. I, I'm just um, delighted Ooh. to hear the enthusiasm um, for retaining uh, the Aquatic Centre in Part 2. Um, it is um, the only option open to me. Um, I, uh, I'm agnostic on exactly where. I have a strong suspicion that locating it in the quarter opposite Barton Terrace uh, West will be strongly contested by <coughs> residents um, and that it may in fact um, be disadvantageous in terms of uh, transport arrangements uh, and therefore that leaves open the, uh, the northeastern site um, or the existing site. Um, uh, but either way, um, the key to it is, in my view, as the Lord Mayor observed, a 50 metre pool. That is what is required for all competition. I'm talking about and competition. That is what provides the rub to businesses in the area. It brings people to North Adelaide and those people in turn support businesses. And every accommodation venue in North Adelaide will tell you in the good old days when it, uh, it operated as a competitive swim facility, there was a pick in accommodation and businesses generally. I also endorse the view that was expressed about some kind of water polo diving facility. Um, I have been um, uh, approached by a number of organisations saying that um, it is crucial for their water polo sport to be able to continue uh, to use uh, a facility at the Aquatic Centre. Uh, and moreover, um, others have uh, explained to me that the only diving facility um, outside of uh, the Aquatic Centre for many people would be available at Marriott. And in cases where, and there are a great number of uh, kids particularly, um, competing in diving at, and at a championship level, international, national level. Um, the, the prospect of travelling from Salisbury or uh, similar northern suburbs to Marion is both inconvenient and, and daunting. Um, if it is to be anything, it should be a regional facility. It should be one that caters for all of the things that I've uh, talked about but with a price tag around $20 million. Um, <laughs> may I just make the chair the, the quick point that the decision that is being made on this when it is made is a decision for half a century, just as the last one was. And therefore, it has to be carefully considered in the context of growth over the next half century. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Anyone else, Councillor Donovan? Thanks, yeah. Um, I too am curious about the the Franklin Street location, some more information, and although acknowledging that there's no other existing facility that you found that does the combined mm -hmm. project, I think it's an interesting one to consider. Um, I appreciate that that's probably a truckload of work to attempt to properly consider it, um, but given it is a city facility, that location does service a group that are not currently getting that kind of service, of course, mm -hmm. when it's sitting in North Adelaide. Um, on the flip side, though, I think the point about the Game 1 strategy is really relevant, that that is all about collaboration. And if the current stats were to uh, perpetuate into the future and only 7% of City of Adelaide residents are actually utilising the, or, or ratepayers are utilising the facility, then it is exactly that, a collaborative opportunity that um, hopefully is appealing to, uh, to the state government. I would definitely think we could only be looking at a, a regional facility um, given this is something, as Phil said, that we're, we're actually going to make a decision that's going to last so far into the future. Um, yes. Gentlemen? Um, I have a question. Sorry. Uh, the six, seven million to demolish it. So um, if you demolish it, obviously you get a return to plant plans. That's the whole price. That, that's what you're quoting here. But if you demolish it and build on the same site, what's the, just the demolition costs? Could, could, sorry. 
So your preside member could be exactly the same if you're actually rebuilding a new centre. Um, so it, we would go away as part of the next steps to do the detailed feasibility. So the, 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 there's pros and cons to both. I think the, the reality is the cost may come down in regards to demolition for the current site. Um, however, you don't have business continuity in regards to service. Mm -hmm. However, you would see a reduction in cost to council over a two, two and a half year period, which is obvious in regards to, to the cost. Um, so we, we go away and have a look at that in regards to, first of all, what would a facility of scale, as indicated, subject to council endorsement, cost? And then if it was done on site, how we can minimise the impact in regards to cost, so on and so forth. Well, um, just like Councillor Martin, the Lord Mayor, it's not negotiable for me. I want it on Park 2. I'm not really fast where. Um, obviously, that would come down to the costings um, in regards to, you know, all that you just said. Um, I think that um, the only thing that concerns me that if we do demolish it to build on the same site is, like the Lord Mayor said, um, there will be a lot of people that uh, use the centre and will miss out on using that centre for two years. There will be clubs, there will be schools, um, general public. People use it for their, you know, go to the centre for their own health and well-being, mental health and well-being. So I don't want that to be lost out there in the community, and that does concern me. So uh, I'm not, I'm not to really. Um, uh, looking forward to seeing it gone completely for two years, if that's the case. Um, I um, understand the point about the residents on, on the uh, on Barton, on Barton Terrace. Um, there would be some people that may uh, be concerned about it being built so close uh, to them, but obviously that will come down to design, I would assume as well. Um, and I would obviously I would assume car parking will be the main concern about where it will be positioned. Um, but if they're looking out to a beautiful building and it, it works within the parklands and it doesn't uh, stick out in, to them, I think that they might find that appealing. So I would assume that it will go out to consultation and um, their, their viewpoints will be given on that. Um, I think it would work well in, the, in that spot where the opposite of the Caledonian for transport, but I take into account some comments that were said. Um, obviously, in the regards to the scale, um, yeah, keeping it to 45 million scope is, would be my preference. Um, and obviously, you know, obviously all the clubs to be able to continue being used as it's used today. Um, but you know, I've said that to you many times, so yeah. Just one, one, one more question. Uh, the other councils, have we approached them as there has been any dialogue with our, our neighbour neighbor councils? Through you, presiding member, uh, the first initial uh, response based on the motion and those that was put up was to respond to uh, first state and federal, and the next one will be now to go to the councils. However, it would be our belief, uh, but yet to be tested, that the, their response will be that they probably don't want to financially contribute. However, it would also be good if we could have them as advocates and supporter when we approach state government and, and federal government based on a regional facility. I think the challenge would be is they would say that their repairs are already contributing through paying for the fees for service. However, in saying that, I would, I would like to challenge them. Thank you. Tom, any other questions? No, we're all good. Thank members. So just the, the next steps, just to close off. Uh, so following the workshop, uh, it was our intention to come back to Council in November and December, just a report outlining the preferred options so we could actually start to progress. The most important bit for us is actually to undertake a detailed feasibility, which will actually talk to everything that the elected members have been talking to tonight. Um, and we will actually talk to the report will also outline what is required to actually progress with that. That's listed above. Thanks, Tom. Um, since there is no further items of business on the agenda, I declare the meeting closed. Thanks, Thank you. Have a great day.